Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. So, um, as you know, this event is brought to you by Worship Tabernacle Church. So, just before we start, I'm just going to open up with a quick prayer and then I'll pass you over to your host. So, Father God, we just thank you, Lord, Father God, for allowing this event to go ahead. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for our amazing panel, Father God, and our host, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, Father God, that whatever you've purposed for this event, Father God, it will come to pass, Father God. I pray, Lord, that people will be blessed. I feel that, I pray that people will be encouraged, Lord, Father God, and motivated, Lord, Father God. And I pray, Lord, Father God, that this event will open doors um, to people to get opportunities, insight, wisdom, Lord. I just pray, Lord, whatever you purpose for this event will come to pass. In your mighty name, I pray. Amen. I'm going to pass it over to um, Mercedes Benson, who will be your host tonight. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, um, Stella, for that nice intro. Um, where is our chat? Where is our chat? Okay, amazing. If you guys are excited to be on this call right now, can we put some hands in the air emoji? I just want to see that there is people on this call. I want to see that you're active and you're participating. I also want to make sure that you're not going to be quiet because I want a lot of questions in this session. Okay, Faye, yep, I love that. Any, there's 31 of us, Koa and Teniola, amazing. Like there's definitely 30 of you guys. I want you guys to be as engaged as possible. Cindy, I see you. Hillary, I see you. Okay, Jerome. All right, wicked. This is good. This is really good. Hi, Dami, John, Alessia. Okay, perfect. I feel like we're ready. So my name is Mercedes Benson. I am a DJ, content creator, and I also am the founder of Social Fixed. And our aim is to connect Black people into the creative industry one job post at a time i'm also a part of wtxl and to be honest to find uh, a department and a group in church that was literally mirroring what i've been trying to do um outside of church it was it was literally like easy when i was just like i have to be a part of this team and so i'm really excited that we're able to do something specifically around the creative industry now 
I'm not gonna lie like I'm 29 and my mum still doesn't really know what I do to today um so being in the creative industry is a struggle especially when you're trying to explain to your parents who are probably coming from very traditional backgrounds yo mum I want to work in marketing what is what is marketing I want to work as a creative director what are you creating there are lots of questions that they're going to be asking you music music is the devil's playground like that so trust me when I know working in the creative industry is very hard when you're trying to co-art okay you can relate it's hard it's really hard but there is so much money to be made I think based on our stats um what was it again I think the creative industry in the UK brings in over like 10 billion pounds a year to the UK economy so if there's not money to be made in the creative industry I really don't know what is so we're going to find out all the tea tips and tricks to get into the creative industry ourselves um it will be good to know if you could pop in the chat you know what part of the industry are you trying to get into are you a videographer do you want to be a journalist do you want to work in fashion um yeah drop it in the comment section and um it'll be good to know because there might be some amazing people yes beauty absolutely beauty is booming when it comes to creative industry oh my god there's another mercedes in the chat <gasps> that is amazing she wants to be a fashion designer i love that um, right, so let me stop babbling. I'm going to introduce you guys to our amazing panelists who are seasoned professionals in the creative industry um, across different parts of the industry. So um, let's go from, well, actually, my order is going to be different. Let's start off with Sean. Sean, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, um, and what your day to day looks like? Sure. Um, so yeah, I am a junior campaign manager at EMI Records. Um, this comes under Universal Music Group and I've been there for roughly two and a half years. Um, my role sits within the marketing team and so I'm essentially responsible for um, organising and managing artist projects in the UK and internationally. Um, so this is everything from marketing strategy to creative, so commissioning videos and photo shoots, um, as well as looking after the campaign and then analysing the results. Um, yeah, I think that sort of sums that up in a, in a nutshell. What do you want more? Um just a quick one what did you study at university yeah so i actually studied international politics um which is very different to what i'm doing now but I interesting the journey so like, we'll, we'll get into that so my girl went from studying international politics to um working in emi which is an amazing record label we're going to get into that that's, that's <laughs> um alice tell us a little bit about yourself what you do um and what your day-to-day -day looks like um, so I work for a brand called Fiorucci and I do the, um, it's a fashion brand, it's women's wear and men's wear. And I work in um, production and product development. And that basically is very much the project management of everything to do with making up the garment. So I'm kind of managing all the factories we work with, um, the suppliers, I'm sourcing the fabric, I'm checking all the artwork, I'm approving it. Um, I'm also um, doing all the fit comments. So I work with a lot of um, different models on a day to day basis, fitting all the garments, making sure they look good, um, all in order to, that we deliver on time to our different um, retailers all across the world. Um, so I do that. And then I've just started my own fashion brand as well. That's always something I've wanted to do. So I also run that as well as work full time for Fiorucci. Yeah. I love that. And Fiorucci is such a cool brand. They've got a really cool store. I think it's like in Soho. Yeah. In that yeah area. Yeah. You guys have done collaborations with Adidas as well. Yeah. Um, and I love the fact that you, you're still a fashion designer for your own brand, but that doesn't yeah. stop you for working for another fashion brand as well. Um, because yeah. sometimes people feel like they've got to pick a side, like I have to be an entrepreneur but you can do a bit of both which is great yeah absolutely and I think I think the way fashion is now they're a lot more they know that you know people are creative and they want to have their own um side things so like even the head of menswear he's also got his own brand so it's it's definitely the culture these days that you can you can really do it both yeah 
amazing okay next up we've got israel peters can you tell us a little bit about who you are what you do um oh actually alice what did you study in university i did fashion design with business studies so you knew that this is what you yeah. wanted to do. I always wanted to do fashion, yeah, from young. Okay, yeah. perfect. All right, let's move into Israel Peters. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and what your day-to-day -day looks like. Um, so I work in video production primarily. Um, I work for a tech company, and I look after all their video production in the UK, and as of 2017 or so, South Africa as well. Um, and that is anything from a very standard corporate sort of how to video all the way through to like commercials, marketing campaigns, product launches. I also run a production company, which I started a few years ago now. Well, wow, it's been ages now. Um, and yeah, so we work with brands, agencies, again, similarly, photography campaigns, video production all the way through to commercials and very recently moving into TV production, which has been interesting um what was the last question yeah i mean what your day-to-day -day looks like we can elaborate on it a little bit more yeah. a little bit later but today's lots busy, of emails basically. lots of calls yeah very <laughs> yeah. busy and fun fact guys me and israel used to work together at a gospel station called otv Good. um when That's i fun. wanted to be a presenter um, and who did we, we, it was crazy. We were just interviewing lots of gospel artists. You were flying around the world, Nigeria, New York. Um, yeah, like OT, Vegas. Oh no, you didn't come to Vegas. We went I to the, the gospel yeah. awards in Vegas. Just so kidding. yeah, a fun fact as well. Israel is a, a pastor's kid, aren't you? Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to let you guys <laughs> know. Thanks for dropping that in. <laughs> yeah, 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 this is a church event. So we just want to be as real as possible. <laughs> this is great okay and what did you study in university i studied uh contemporary media production okay lovely it so you fantastic. kind of you kind of knew that this was the lane that you were going to be in from yeah. early as well yeah perfect all right and last but not least we have michael michael can you tell us a little bit about what you do what your day-to-day -day looks like um, cool. I'm currently a contractor across different media agencies. My current contract is at um, ZF Media, where I'm the paid social manager. My day-to-day, -day, um, currently on the H&M account, which is helping them with their strategy across H&M beauty, fashion, and I think they're bringing a lifestyle and sport. Um, that's where I plan all of their campaigns across Snapchat, TikTok, Facebook, um, Instagram, and other mediums that they want me to use. Um, and I help with the creative in terms of what creates might look good depending on the platform they want to use. I'm um, alongside that along the way when I started my career journey in media or media marketing or digital marketing, I say, I met a friend called Daniel when we started. Um, I began with him, um, a business called AGM, which is a talent management and music marketing agency. Um, and then I feel like with him, he'd been there for a long time, but I started joining with him like a year ago mm -hmm. um, as the operation, chief operations officer. And that's been good, part of the journey. So a lot of things I learned from working my full-time job by talking to working with him which is kind of dope sick I've heard a lot about um that talent agency you got some really cool clients on there um and yeah so paid social so you're kind of about you're all about social media marketing numbers yeah. you know all of that kind of stuff what did you study at uni history Every time I tell people I study history, they look at me this like this look of like history, like I've never had anyone there, but I study history. Yeah. I don't think my mom would have ever let me study history, you know. Like... No, I didn't get it. How I spun it, how I actually spun during the course was that growing up, my her in her head, I'm gonna be a lawyer. So what I spun is that there's a stat that shows a lot of people who study history and study math actually go on to do law. But I just liked history. So I, I know you, you defo Googled that and said, mom, mom, yeah. look, 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 look. <laughs> 100%. That's the only way she'll allow it. But yeah, I don't, I'll tell you history. Wow. Yeah. That is, that is very interesting. That is an interesting transition. We're going to get yeah. into that. All right. So actually, do you know what? Let's segue um, into that topic. How did you, what, how and why did you know that you wanted to work in the creative industry? What was that moment that made you think, I don't want to, I don't want a career in history. I don't want a career as a lawyer. 
how did you get into media marketing and like social media marketing? Like that's a big jump. What was that moment that said, yeah, I want to go into this lane? True story. Um, I don't know if anyone in the panel, if anyone's seen a film called Boomerang, with Eddie Murphy, where he plays a marketing exec. And because I watched that film, I think I watched it in my, like, my third year of uni. But I just knew I like strategy and I like thinking, my epic history. So because I watched that film, I just think being a marketing exec in my head, that's what it looked like. So I thought it'd be absolutely amazing. So after I graduated, did you I think you were going to get girls from pitching perfume nah, campaigns? Nah, not at all. Do you know what it was, yeah? <laughs> my honest truth is yes and no, because <laughs> Boom, Eddie Murphy made it look so cool. Like the way he stepped in, yeah. like had your braids, like the... But then the reality of it was completely different because after I graduated uni, you can't get into it as simple as I thought I could do. Mm. So I ended up so I ended up bouncing. I worked in office shoes in Topman, got fired. Um, worked in a, went back to my old secondary school to work with some of the teachers, got fired. Um, ended up working in a gym and then did a receptionist. And then my story is quite unconventional because I met a guy working in the gym who used to be the vice president of Live Nation became friends and I told him what my goal was to be because I always tried to pursue it in one way or another and he got me my first interview as practice so he didn't think wow. I would get the job and then um I got the job we just maintained friends since then but that was the start of my journey wow yeah so it's almost do you know what I love about your story every every moment you got fired and kind of touching on what Pastor Ty said yeah. every bit of rejection was pushing you into the space where you would then meet this amazing guy from Live Nation yeah. in your gym, but you would be ready to tell him what you want to do and then just go from there. Like that, yeah. and how many years did it take from getting fired from having that initial, I've, I've watched this film, this is what I want to do to actually landing your first job in the industry. How long did that take? I graduate, I watched that film, I want to say 2012. I got my first job in OMD when I was in 2015. No, yeah, 2015. So it's three years between the time I saw this film, made the decision. What a mad roller coaster to get in there. And yeah, so three years. And for anyone who's listening, OMD is like a really big media company. Um, did you know that OMD existed? Like, how did you get to that level where you oh. knew that, okay, I want to apply and work for OMD? I had no clue who OMD were. He literally yeah. said to me, there's a job offer at OMD International, do your research. I did my research, find out what they actually did. Because at that point, I had an idea of marketing until I actually joined it. Mm -hmm. um, and then he actually got me the interview. When I got there, like people that were interviewing were like in t-shirts, like normal normal shorts. And I came in a suit with a bow tie like and a, and a briefcase and an umbrella because I thought it made me look smart. But then the image I had in my head, which was obviously boomerang, and then what it actually was, because it was pretty different. So, but they said to me that day, because I came in that way, that's the reason why they gave me the job. I had no prior experience, zero. I worked in the gym. I knew nothing about like the day to day of what they did. My first client was Carlsberg. So there was like a, a real like, um, wow. a real like step into a big client in a massive agency. So that's when I had to just learn on the go. Yeah. And I think that's the reality of the creative industry. A lot of us are coming from spaces where we don't actually know that much, but the exposure that you were able to get and having that one person who also believes in you. So it's also important to say with your chest, like, okay, this is what I want to do because you just never know who you're going to meet that might be able to help you on that journey. So I love the fact that everyone's in this, in this room right now in this webinar, because even if you've just got a little idea that, I think I want to work in the creative industry, but I just don't know what to do. Hopefully this panel will just bring some sort of inspiration for you to then do your research and keep going with that little idea. Um, Cheryl, let's, let's jump into you. What was that moment where you were just like, I want to work in the creative industry. I want to work in music. Was that a thing or did you just land into this role? Um, yeah, so basically, um, as I mentioned, I studied um, international politics, international relations at uni, um, and I actually wanted to be a diplomat, similar to Michael, um, I studied history at A-level, and I was like, okay, cool, I really love this, like, this is super interesting to me, and then in my final year, I um, 
did a semester abroad in Malaysia and I think that sort of opened me up to just like a whole new world like it really just changed my perspective and so I got back and I was like okay I sort of want to do something creative but I wasn't quite sure yet um and so during uni I started basically DJing on the side like I was DJing for friends and stuff um doing events here and there and I sort of that was the moment where I started to realize okay cool this could actually be a career path um from there I basically applied to loads of jobs. I ended up landing uh, a marketing internship at a tech startup. Again, I was like, okay, cool. I want to work in marketing. Let me just, you know, get in where I can fit in. So I was there for roughly about six months. Um, and then I was at a company called Liberty. Um, they're a really cool um, youth marketing um, agency slash sort of culture network. Um, and I was there working in sort of social media and digital management. Um, there was a few stuff that I did um, in partnership with labels. So I was like, okay, cool. This is great. I'm not there yet, but, you know, I have a bit of experience that can sort of help me along the way. Um, again, you're going to hear a lot of jobs because I essentially did a lot of fixed term contracts. So I couldn't just, I couldn't land a full-time role. Um, so after Liberty, I was at Global Radio. Um, they're a huge brand who um, they essentially own a lot of the national commercial radio stations. So Capital, Heart. LBC, um, Smooth, um, and I was working in their commercial marketing team across their album campaigns, classical music, which was different because <laughs> I do not listen to classical music. But again, I was like, you know, let me see what I can just learn from this experience. Um, then I moved on to Jamie Oliver Group. Again, trying wow. to find a role, couldn't find a role. I was like, okay, cool. There's a marketing role at um, Jamie Oliver Group. I was unemployed for like maybe around six, seven months. And I was like, I just need a job. Um, was at Jamie Oliver Group working um, across his TV show. It was like a Christmas TV show and his book releases. Um, and then it was, it was a very conventional um, sort of path from Jamie Oliver Group to Universal Music. I'd essentially been applying for tons of roles, um, was interviewing here and there, but wasn't quite getting anywhere. Um, and then I bumped into a friend and they were sort of like giving me advice and was like, do you know what, why don't you sort of like reach out to a senior person at the label you want to work at? And I was like, okay, cool. I've sort of done that. I've messaged people on LinkedIn, like I've done all of that. And he was like, no, go for the most senior person. So um, <laughs> I essentially knew the email format because I'd been to, um, I'd gone through other interviews at Universal Music Group. Um, and I knew the name of the president because I was just reading up on a lot of like commercial news and stuff. So yeah, on a late Wednesday night. You emailed the president. Yes. And yes. About the president, I essentially was just like, look, this is what I've done. This is what I'm looking for. I attached links to the projects I'd worked on, the artists that I've worked with. And I was like, look, I know you're busy, but if there's an opportunity to join your label, I'd love to know about it. Um, he responded on Sunday and I honestly nearly fell off my chair <laughs> and he was just like, yeah, hooking you up with um, my HR contact. And from there I got an interview, another interview, and then I landed at EMI. So Sis! <laughs> a bit of a whirlwind, I can't lie. That is absolutely amazing. Literally, yeah. Sharon said it, shoot your shot. Yeah, you have No to one is it. going to believe in your source if you do not believe in it yourself. That is bold. And the thing is as well, like you probably did it and just left it, like. I did, it was in God's hands when I sent that email. I wasn't even worrying about it. Yeah, I didn't even think I was gonna get a response, but I just did it to say that I had done it, so. Wow. And how long did it take between, so in Malaysia, you said that you realized you wanted to do something creative, like um, how, what, kick, what, what was the, that, the thing in Malaysia? Um, I don't know what it was. I think it was just maybe, I was obviously there for four months. I was meeting new people. I think it just sort of just opened like my perspective beyond, you know, parents being like, oh, you need to do something corporate or something, blah, blah, blah. And I think, I don't know, at that point, it was sort of like a epiphany, like, oh, I want to do something creative. And during that time as well, I was just teaching myself how to DJ in my room as well, watching YouTube. And then I think the two at the same time sort of, then influenced me to be like, okay, maybe try this as an option. Uh, nice. Yeah. Oh, wow. I got goosebumps. That's crazy. Thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, Alice, okay, so you you knew you wanted to be a fashion designer. Yeah. Like, fashion's been your thing. Like, mm -hmm. what's your earliest memory of you think, knowing that, yeah, this fashion is what I want to do for the rest of my life? 
Um, earliest memory. I think I just remember one time just being at home and then my dad's friend was like, oh, what do you want to be when you're older? I think I was maybe like eight or something. And it literally just popped into my mind. I can't even tell you like where I first saw a fashion designer. Maybe it was Clueless or something. I don't know. And then, yeah, I was just like, I want to be a fashion designer. And then since then, I was just always sketching. I done it for like GCSEs. I done it for A-levels. Then I did a foundation. I went to Chelsea College of Art and Design. I did it there. And then I was um, very kind of adamant that I wanted to go to Brighton University because I knew they had um, really good industry links with um, different fashion brands. And a part of the course, you have to do internships. So again, I went there and I just, it, it was very much, I've just always loved doing fashion. But I think um, what made me kind of expand and see that there's more than just being a fashion designer was when I'd done an internship um, in my third year in uni. And I went, I'd done it at um, a small fashion label called Matthew Williamson. And it was um, kind of like luxury fashion. And there I saw that there was like, you know, product development, then there was production, then there was the sales side, then there was actually being a designer. So I really saw like the operation side of it. And I think that's where I really fell in love with. Actually, I enjoy like the project management side of things. I love to source factories. You know, I love, love, love sourcing uh, materials as well and, and actually working quite hands on with the fabric. So I think that internship, I kind of came out knowing that, right, I actually don't want to be a fashion designer. I want to do product development or production. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely say if you are thinking about, you know, being in fashion, internship, you know, everywhere, because you just get so much exposure to all the different um, roles that are available. It's really good at networking as well. You know, I know I still know like people from that internship, you know, so um, I think it was definitely yeah, that that was the moment that I'm like, right, this is how I'm going to, you know, be strategic. And so after uni, you know, my first job was then product development for Lacoste. So it was very much like, mm. you know, I was able to, to, to actually get what I, what I wanted. So I'd say as well, you know, you can go in with a plan. You can be very strategic about it. Um, and as whereas well a lot of my um, friends, they kind of wanted to do design. I saw that there was this gap that not Thank everyone you. was looking at. Yeah, not Absolutely. everyone was looking at product development which basically you work really close with the designers and you still get the kind of creative aspect when you choose what kind of technique you're going to you know use for a particular garment or what kind of fabric you're going to use so you still are very much hands-on but whereas design is completely competitive oversubscribed um product mm -hmm. development and production isn't as um so yeah that's kind of what made me um decide on that and when you realized that product development was something that you wanted to do in your third year of uni, that was when you did the yeah. internship, right? Um, how was it like taking that back to like your uni lecturers? Did they facilitate you in kind of getting that Lacoste job or did you kind of just take the rein and do it yourself too? Because to get Lacoste as your first job straight out of uni is very, very impressive. So like how, what was, what happened between that internship and getting that job? Yeah, I think I, they didn't really help me because I think final year was about like final collection, it was dissertation, so it wasn't really, they didn't really have the chance to do that. But what I remember doing is actually going on job boards. So like, I think at the time it was about Drapers. There's a really good website called Drapers Online, which is where all the fashion brands are, um, fashionjobs.com. And then I literally um, would look at the spec um, of what these jobs required. Um, my sister works in HR, so she literally would say to me, right, look at what it takes to be a product developer, what you're doing on a day to day basis. And then I very much tailored my um, my CV to be that I've kind of done those things, even if it was like a really small experience that I got from my internship. I basically wrote that I'd done it. So, you know, there were times where on my internship, I had to go and 
go to the fabric stores in Soho and then bring them back to the studio. And then instead of saying, you know, you could just write, I'm go, I had to go to the stores and buy fabric, but I said I had to source the fabric for this particular um, garment. So you want to really learn the language that they're using and you can find that out just through reading these job specs. So I very much made it out as if I kind of did more than I did. Um, and then just, yeah, and by just using their language, also just speaking to people from your internship, getting advice from them because they're doing what you essentially want, want to do. Um, but I think the main thing is I made my CV look professional, like I wasn't just an intern. Um, and then I think that's what really kind of, um, cause I remember when I had that interview, they were like, you know, they were just really impressed in my application. I then put images of my, my final collection as well and explain how I product developed that. I kind of made it out that I sourced like the fabric and the factories for that. Um, so I'd say definitely look at job boards, look at what language they're using, look at the different um, tasks and then try and just bring that into your CV. And I think that kind of wows them, especially if you are just, you know, a graduate. Yeah. But yeah, that's the website. Amazing. Thank you so much, yeah. Israel. So, I mean, you again, you kind of always knew that, you know, you were going to work within the video film creative space um as a young person because you're old now obvs joking um next go next <laughs> what was the point you know in your youth <laughs> sorry i don't even know what i'm making <laughs> sorry we've got mad banter we've got mad banter um what was the moment where you were just like yeah i want to i want to pursue a career in this space <clears throat> um, I go. I think I go a little bit further back because you're right. I was, I'm a bit of an anomaly because I knew in secondary school. So we, um, my secondary school, were trialing out this course for our year. They definitely wanted us all to fail, but it was media studies, and they were like, "It's the first time we're introducing it to the curriculum." And I was like, Ooh, "Media studies." And funny enough, I actually initially wanted to study history. And um, what is it with history today? I know, right? And everyone was like, that is the most boring subject on earth. So I just winged it and picked this new media studies course, which I thought, oh, okay, can't be as bad as history. And then we, I think halfway through the course, first of all, it was sick. And then halfway through the course, they took us on this week long sort of, oh, what was it? Was it work? It was work experience back then. I don't think at that age you were allowed to intern. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, it was work, yeah, it was work experience. So we had this week long work experience at the BBC Sick. and it was, we covered radio, we covered TV and then we covered journalism over that week. And I had the most fun I've ever had in my life. And I was a bit of a, I was, I was a bit of a troublesome kid at school, right? So nothing kept my attention for long and that absolutely did. So I was like, okay, fair enough. And then I think every decision I sort of made after that kind of led to where I am now. So when I went to college, again, I took on media studies just straight off the back. And I remember the conversation with my mom because she thought I was going to do engineering, <laughs> um, computer, computer engineering. And so I did, I put IT on there. So it was English literature, IT and media studies, but I knew what the focus was. <laughs> um, so it did that as well. And then while we were at uni, uh, uni while we were at co college, sixth form, um, a group of us started this random production house type thing, right? Where we would just go and film anything. And we had a lot of friends who were in the, back then, the gospel scene. Um, and The gospel God, scene we, is still there, by the it way. It is, it is. But, but I remember, oh, oh 09, there was Jesus Junkie, Jesus yeah, but this Junkie. was just before then. This was a, oh, little, okay. bit, a okay. little bit before then. Yeah. And Governor was doing his album launch. Oh my God, Governor! Completely forgot the name of the album. Oh, okay. album was it was the one with um. Ah. Uh, anyway, okay. I digress. Um, so he was like, "Ah, oh, like you guys come down and film," and I was like, "All right, cool." So me and Paul, we got like we went. So like Paul knew this guy that ran a production studio, so we borrowed two of his cameras. Bearing in mind we're like sixteen, yeah. So we borrowed two of these cameras and we just went to this event and we just, we filmed it, set up two cameras. Did you know what you were doing? 
Yeah, because obviously we, had, we were both doing media courses, so we had worked with cameras. So, like, yeah, okay. This guy had shown us quite a few bits. And then so we went in, obviously, well, you know what? In answer to that question, um, did we know what we were doing? We filmed the whole event, yeah, and didn't record any sound. <laughs> <laughs> and this is an album launch. So, that, so it's actually, <laughs> it's really significant that we had sound. So, but at that event, there was this guy, Shabazz, and he had come up to us and he was some any one man band, but he had this random camera. It was just him by himself with a microphone going around, running and gunning it um, and just filming. And like, I don't know, back then, like, I don't know, little boys and their pride, right? Because our, our cameras were bigger. We didn't take him seriously. And like, he was like, like, at the event, he was like, oh, like, you guys should take my details. I love seeing young black boys doing their thing. And we were like, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll take your details. Um, and then turns out we needed him because he recorded sound. <laughs> and then um, he later became our mentor because that same guy was senior editor at Nickelodeon. Wow. So, yeah, it's like all the like SpongeBob, all that stuff you watched, he was the guy. And then he had also just finished launching MTV Base Africa. What? Yeah. So he was like the real deal, but we had initially just like completely dismissed him. And so that was like a massive learning curve. Like respect everyone. Doesn't respect matter. everyone. Yeah. Imagine like, if you missed that opportunity. Like yeah, it could have been that, so. To wow. Yeah, we wouldn't have gone. To, so OTV then followed because they brought because OTV was this amazing thing that I think one of the guys that essentially helped build it was a senior producer at the BBC who had then moved and came and he just brought all these amazing black African Caribbean creatives together Shabazz is one of them and he brought us in like and we were like 17 16 17 18 he was our mentor and he taught us everything we knew we were running and gunning around the city just filming and editing and like he was so brutal so like we would film stuff and then he would watch it back with us as you do back then because back then it was tape it wasn't like like SD cards or like digital it was all tape so everything had to you had to in order to digitize a 16 minute tape you had to watch it back for 60 minutes. And he would come and sit with us and be like, do you think that was a good shot? And we'd be like, yeah. And he will be like, nah, it wasn't. <laughs> but we filmed it, there's nothing you can do. It's tape, you just gotta wait for the tape to finish. So that was like a massive pivotal moment. And just like, and imagine this, is, I'm learning this at before I'm 18. So it was very like sort of forming of the rest of my career. And then I went to uni and then in uni, I think the next step there was, um, we, well, London 2012 happened, timing, right? And so they came to four unis in the UK, my uni, Kingston, uh, I think Wolverhampton and another uni. And they basically gave all the students that were like studying film production, media studies, they gave them all jobs at the London Olympics. And that was insane because you had production houses from the whole world, everywhere, like China, Canada, America, and like, the the sort of takeaway from that was just network network mm -hmm. network network a lot of people got really good jobs i think three people off the back of that ended up moving to the us like it was yeah it was dope so i think yeah that, that was my journey random i love i these stories wow absolutely love it guys if you're inspired throw some fire emojis in the chat right now because i'm very much hot because it's too much. There's too much tea going on. It's, there's too much blessings happening right now. Um, if you have any questions as well, make sure you pop those questions into the Q&A box right there at the bottom of your screen because, you know, I'm sure there's so many personalised situations going on and I know you're going to want to ask some amazing questions at the end of this. Um, Dami in the chat said something so amazing and it's true. A common theme across these stories is that the more you put yourself out there, the more opportunities come your way, even if it's in the form of rejection. Now, you know, we've heard about your stories, your come up, that one moment. For all the young people, old people, do you know what, let me stop doing the age thing actually, just for anyone who is wanting to get into the creative industry now, how what would you advise is the best way to get yourself out there we are living in a social media generation some people are saying put everything that you love put your whole portfolio on instagram sell yourself some people are like you know 
work hard behind the scenes it's not about what you show it's about you know what the work that you do some people are like nah getting getting a job is 80 percent networking 20 percent what you actually bring to the table so there's loads of different lanes and avenues that people are finding or people are saying is the right way to get a job in the creative industry because it's not as easy as like you go to medical school you do your seven years you do your two-year foundation you will get a job do you know what I mean? Creative industry is, there's a lot of gray areas. So, um, Shell, what piece of advice would you, advice would you say to someone um, on how to put themselves out there if they want to get a job? Um, I would probably say, I'd say actually be creative with your job search. Um, I say that because you know, you can look on LinkedIn, you can look on the dots, which is great if anybody's um, looking for jobs. It's essentially like a creative version of LinkedIn. Um, you can look on Indeed, all these sort of like job sites, but there's just so many other ways where you can look for opportunities. You know, there are like music industry events for, you know, people that want to get into the industry. I think there's Ultimate Seminar. Obviously, I know Mercedes, you do social fixed events, stuff like that. There'll be people who are, you know, maybe more experienced than you that you can, you know, sort of network with and build relationships with. I'd also say um, some of the things that I did was essentially on LinkedIn, you know, you can search in the jobs portal. I would actually search keywords um, in the posts section. So those are people that are posting links, mm. or postings, but not necessarily on the job portal. So that's um, a good tip. I'd also actually search keywords in Twitter as well, in case there were people like posting, you know, I'm hiring for a music marketing assistant, whatever. So I do that. Um, what are the other things I used to do? Yeah, go down to events. Again, as I mentioned, like I wouldn't suggest sliding into everyone's dms on instagram and all these different platforms but if the platform is appropriate like the dots or linkedin reach out to someone who doesn't even necessarily have to be super senior they could be just a level above you they might have more time for you to just give you advice on sort of the things that you could do um i'd also say as well like don't neglect um your sort of like side hustles and stuff so i was obviously djing at the time and so i knew a lot of people in the industry from there they you know, there was a few interviews that I got off the back of those relationships as well. Um, and I think bringing that experience into my interviews and telling them, oh, yeah, so I DJ and do all of this. It really just showed them um, that I was proactive, that I could teach myself something and that I was already sort of like in the scene and sort of understood how the music industry worked to some degree. Um, so, yeah, those are sort of like my top tips. Mm. And Sharon, what I love about your hustle in being able to find a job in all those different spaces is that when you were searching the keyword, DMing a few people, emailing a few people, how much expectation did you have in those interactions? Because I think sometimes a lot of us get disheartened quite quickly when you're putting yourself out there or you're, you're, you're hustling across social media across the across the internet and you're either getting no's or you're just getting airtime so did you have a lot of expectation or did you just kind of leave it up to god leave it up to just like well i've done my best um let me just keep going and see what lands like what was your what was your mindset because you didn't have any permanent jobs for a while so yeah how did you make money? How did you mentally cope? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so my expectations were very low because I just knew, like, notoriously, it's very hard to get into the music industry. In, you know, the UK, there are three major labels and a lot of people will stay in those jobs for, like, years and years and years. So I already knew it was going to be hard. And so I think because I went in with that expectation, it sort of um, meant that I didn't give up so quickly. And so, you know, from like maybe the first year after leaving uni, I knew I wanted to work at a music label. I would apply to the roles, the internships, all of that. But in addition to that, I'd also be applying to other marketing jobs because I knew if I don't get the music job, I can't just be here like unemployed. I need to find something else. And maybe there will be transferable skills from that role to where I eventually want to be. So I did that, landed a fixed term contract. Again, after that, I landed another like, fixed term contract and from there surprisingly like I had learned so much that was valuable to my role now so I'd worked in a little bit of tv a little bit of e-commerce a little bit of radio a little bit of social media all of that 
all of those areas are things that I literally use on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'd say don't be disheartened if you don't get there straight away, like there are transferable skills and there's loads of things that you can pick up on the way, which will eventually help you. Amazing. Um, Michael, now your side of the industry, I feel like is quite new, like paid media, um, you know, Facebook ads, um, SEO. These are, for me, I find them so clinical, like it almost feels like a degree in itself, yet it, it is all based around social media and websites so it's all new what would you say are some kind of great pieces of advice that you could give to anybody who would like actually want to get into your industry um is do you need to have all these technical skills um do you need to do a digital marketing course or like yourself you just learn on the job so what advice would you give for somebody who wants to get into like advertising marketing paid media uh, truthfully, I said there's no harm in doing it all. Um, I'm lucky. I met someone who got me into the job. When everyone has the same story as me, but before that, you can go and like um, Facebook have a learning course, an e-learning course, which you'd have to pay for. I did it for free, but you have to pay for it's like a like hundred pounds. It's worth doing it. Make sure CV's mm -hmm. done that more than someone else who hasn't done it. So when you're going into an account exec role, if they can see that you're Facebook accredited, you're more likely to be seen. Um, you can you can go into uh, Google Ads. They have an e-learning course where you can get certification. There's Twitter, Flight School. There's a Snapchat one. And oh, wait, wait, wait. Can... Slow down, slow down. We need to be okay. writing this. Wait. <laughs> Google. There's a Google, Google Ads, Ads one. There is Facebook, a Facebook accreditation. There is Twitter. one called Twitter Flight School. Tell me about and Twitter then... Flight School. I've never heard of that in my entire life. So Twitter Flight School is essentially another course to teach you how to use the ads manager. Um, and then, like, see, my part of media is quite technical but it's fun depending on how you like to think about things. Mm. So what paid me this essentially is never the first point of call is when all the creative side is done that you give us the ads to expose to everyone on all these separate platforms. And you have to think strategically, which is again, it's a strategic thinking, but it's, I call it creative things. I actually, I enjoy it. Hence why I actually studied history on purpose because that course allowed me to be able to think about why I say mm. things and why I do things. It's critical and learning to, and thinking yeah. and stuff. Yeah, it's important. So one thing I think is important for everyone who wants to get in, who probably isn't doing a, a course related to paid media or, or digital marketing is that what part of what you're doing now just might be applicable and how could you transcend that into what you want to do next? Um, but if you, if you want to get into it, I would definitely say, like, speak to recruiters. The one thing I did was I spoke to, even whilst I was doing it in my first job, I spoke to recruiters. I even did a technique of making my CV pink. So that way I know if my CV is pink, it stands out from a black and white CV they're going to get at their desk. It gives them something different to look at. Uh, stuff like that, which actually came back to me and said, oh, if I didn't see you, if your CV wasn't pink, I wouldn't have picked it up. So it's so funny stuff like that with recruiters Michael, actually work. Because my, I, my name is Mike Udo, right? It's a very Nigerian name. So you, in your mind, you're going to think, why is this guy's name Michael and his CV is pink? Just out of that pure curiosity, just might pick it up and read it. And it actually worked for some time. Then I changed it to like gold. I might change it to orange <laughs> just to see what happens. But I do it for myself. And I think it's fun. Just to if, if this actually works, then I'm going to keep doing it. So now my CV is on Canva. I've turned it like the formats were weird. But you just do things that relate to you. Especially when I think about digital marketing and payment, my big device I talk to anyone that any interview you get into, and to be yourself, to be exactly who you are, be a version of yourself that you're proud of, that you want someone to look at and be like, yes, I want this person in my job. So a lot of times, especially the fact that paid media is new, more times they already know that you're not going to know anything that the technical job of what it, what it is you're going to do. They just want to say that you're a good person. So how do you relate? How do you speak well? How do you speak with the person right in front of you? How, how can you communicate with someone that is not from the same country as you? So a lot of times, like I work with a lot of multinational people, you have to learn how to speak to someone who may be straight from Italy or straight from France. Mm -hmm. Some of my greatest friends have been from, from countries I've never heard of, like Philippines before this point, or like Romania. And these are people that interview me. So that transferable school is being relatable, just mm -hmm. speaking to people in an honest terms. But the technical way of getting in, I would definitely say is just to build your CV so it looks nice and looks better than most people that, that want to have done it. Just look into what you can learn for free how you can add those qualifications to your CV and that stands you out. So if you've worked in, like I came from a gym, I worked in, I was in sales, which has nothing to do with paid media. Um, 
the only thing that made me stand out was all the stuff that I thought would make me look good. So I remember I was a writer, I was doing creative writing for a friend and a business called Local Kicks. Um, I would do like copywriting for friends and I put up all of my CV. So then I can, then I can just see I'm a sole starter. And most times they just want to see that you're a sole starter. All the technical skills, they can teach you along the way. But the most important thing is I've been in this for like eight, seven years. My goal was to always contract. Just learn everything you possibly can because it gets to a point where your expertise is going to pay you more than it pays someone else. Facts. Facts. Oof. And just to clarify, because um, sometimes I get confused, so even just for me, what exactly is paid media? Cool. So this is the best way to explain it. You have Instagrams on your phone, right? So you that is organic media. That is your organic social. Everything you post in there comes directly from me. Your captions, your pictures, your link in your bio everything paid media is the thin line in between so when you're scrolling down your feed and you just might see an ad that's me or you go to your ig story so you are the algorithm i am the algorithm i am the matrix has anyone watched space jam (laughs) the new one the new one yeah Mr. Alga, yeah, that was kind of funny. Yeah, um, yeah really good show or film. Everyone should watch it. Yeah. Um, so you're the algorithm. Okay. Yeah. But every time you see an ad that is placed in between what you're scrolling past or on your IG story, IG videos, or your Facebook news feeds, for wherever you actually store to Facebook, um, Snapchat, TikTok, that is paid social. There's money put behind a particular ad so that you can see it. And the algorithm on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat judges that you're someone who's likely to interact with my ad because you fit my demographic wow I feel like your career is so much suited for somebody who's really analytical so like if you want to get into the creative industry but you know you're an analytical person you like to play around with numbers um you like to yeah just kind of look a little bit deeper into into things this could be a great career or or industry to be a part of i definitely recommend it for two main reasons again you it's that whole thing of you feel sometimes people think that to be a creative you have to be able to do to like draw or to want to do all these things but you can actually just be a creative thinker that in itself is a skill in its own I, i like to see it as if creativity is my talent that means anything I touch now becomes a tool I would use to be creative with. Jeez. So if creativity, yeah, I'm, I'm a creative person, if I decide I want to draw or if I want to do anything, I will make it the way I would like to become a creative thinker, a creative person. Essentially, if you're just a creative thinker, paid media is a perfect thing because you can build your own career your own way. Um, and the second part, which is vastly important, when you get to a point, which I'm very proud I've got to this point in my career, you dictate your day rate. I get to walk into rooms and tell people this is how much you pay me for my expertise per day. Stop right there. Israel and Michael, because you might be able to give me a little bit more information. Day rate, what is that? So if I'm trying to get into the creative industry, am I not just going to get like a salary? Depends on where you work. Depends if, if, because if you're a permanent staff, you get salary. I'm not a permanent staff. I'm contracted for, what, three, four months at a time or six months or get extended. My day rate is depending on how much you think my expertise is worth. So when I go into a certain role, I would tell them my day rate, I want £300 a day. If they have the budget for it, they pay me that per day for three months. If they like me enough to extend me or my expertise is lower, I have a different day rate, which is £200. But regardless, £200 a day to £300 a day is still a bit more pay or a lot more pay than a permanent salary. Um, but you will need the years experience. Well, for my, for paid media, I'm not yeah. sure about anything else. You will need the years experience to get you to that point. And Israel, how do you determine your day rate? Um, yeah, there's a, I think with production, there's a few factors because you've got, um, you've sort of got industry standards as well. You've got ranges. So for commercial, it's different. It's usually higher than TV. For TV, it's different. What's commercial? Sorry. I, imagine none of us know what you're talking about. Yes, that's a good, yeah. So commercial is anything that isn't terrestrial TV. So anything that isn't like BBC, ITV, you know, so it could be working with Nike. It could be working with Aviva. Um, it's anything that's sort of private. Um, yeah, slightly more higher brow um, clients. And then you've got broadcast, which is which sits very firmly in TV. So BBC, ITV, Channel 4 
but all of those companies will pay different fees. Um, so you have to do the research on the specific role. So, you know, uh, a self-shooting PD would earn this much, whereas a director would earn this much. Whereas, so that every role has its thing. There's, there's um, some resources to help is APA and BEC2. I can put those in the chat for you, um, but they help with identifying what your sort of where you should be sitting at a minimum. And then some of those also tell you where you should sit as a maximum, because like I said, with TV, those rates are fixed. You can't really negotiate out unless, you know, you are the showrunner or unless you're working with like streaming platforms like Netflix, Amazon, all of those guys, they're slightly different rate. Um, but like, you know, um, like Michael said, um, with the day rate it is about your expertise is how long you've worked. Um, it's also dependent on the type of project. So in production, sometimes you're asked for a weekly rate instead or a monthly. So it won't always work out the same, but yeah, it's, it is about researching. It's about understanding your client, what they can afford and also how low you're willing to go. How lucrative is it being contract versus fully employed? Um, it depends on how comfortable you want to be. Oh. <laughs> because, no, I say that because with, be, with being employed, you get holiday pay, you get annual leave, you know, you get certain securities that are really nice, actually. Um, and I don't think anyone should look down on employed people because it's, it's brilliant. It's actually a dream. Um, although, obviously, you're capped at a salary band, depending on the company that you're at. So freelancers tend to make a bit more money, but then you've got to work out your own tax. You may have to do VAT. Um, and if you don't do that, the government will come looking for you. So it, it just depends on how you want to live your life. I mean, I, I recommend trying out both because you never know, but just you have to be organised. That's the main thing. Mm. Um, Alice, like with social media, fashion is just everywhere. You're what, you've got influencers wearing things. You've got independent brands popping up. You've got designers just all over the gaff. If I want a career in fashion, how am I going to stand out? And fashion is like notorious for being quite a, an elitist um, industry, very white, very middle class, because they'll work for free for years just to be a designer's bestie, fly to Paris and then voila. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So like, how do I stand how do what do I do to stand out and get a career in in any parts of the fashion industry I think fashion as you said it is quite elite and we are quite traditional as much as you know there's social media there's independent brands I think um they do like a degree they like you know to have a a BA in fashion design in women's wear in men's wear However, I think the way in, if you aren't able to do that, is internships. Um, pretty much every brand will have interns at some, you know, part of their business. And I think um, social media is actually a really incredible way to find out who, you know, the head of design is, find out who head of production is, find out who's a stylist and and dm them i think um you know the traditional way of um, applying to a job exists of course but you get there so it's so competitive you get so many applications that if you're just going to kind of dm the head of design in instagram they're actually more likely to come back to you um that way and then of course if you've got a um an Instagram profile that shows your work, that shows your um, creativity, how you create the um, the kind of Instagram feed. These are all kind of, you know, tick, tick, tick. So I think as much as possible, really use Instagram as a portfolio, you know, show your designs, show the kind of creative exhibitions you're going to show, you know, your eye for um, photography or a particular detail that really is going to help you stand out from um, you know what everyone else is doing and then use LinkedIn to find out who these people are and then literally find them on Instagram um, and DM them. I recently done a shoot for my own brand and I you know I wanted an intern that was going to help me with the photo shoot 
And, you know, although I put a job board um, out there, it was actually the girl that came in my DM that I ended up, you know, giving that particular opportunity just because instantly it's just, it's so much quicker than going through CVs. Whereas, you know, instantly the DM, you can see what this person's vibe is like. You can see if they've got a good eye for, um, for color, for details, and then boom, you can kind of offer them a job. Um, as well as the practical things, I'd say fashion, you need to know particular um, software. So you need to know Adobe Photoshop. You need to know how to use Illustrator. Um, I wasn't always great at that, but I, I used um, things like Skillshare is a really good online course um, website where you can learn. There's also, I can't remember what it's called now, but there's a whole kind of online fashion school that will teach you how to draw on Illustrator. Cause you will, if you wanna do something like product development or design, you will need to be able to draw clothes on these things. And if you're very good, like a very good way, and if you're good at like make, doing CADs, they call them computer aided design. If you're good at doing that, that will also make you stand out. So as early as possible, if you don't know how to use these um, different platforms, then you know, get on Skillshare and learn how to use Photoshop, Illustrator. Um, and then, yeah, I think it's just about really using your Instagram to show off who you are as a designer, um, as a creative. If you can, I would say, you know, study the course. If you want to do a foundation, London College of Fashion have kind of one year um, courses. They also have online courses. So you don't always have to commit to a degree, but I think it is an extremely competitive industry. And sometimes they kind of won't even look at you if you haven't studied it in some form. So I think just kind of ask yourself, you know, if you really want to do this for the long haul, can you go to university? If not, then I think definitely look at things like Skillshare, London College of Fashion, um, and really learn about not just the creative side of it, but also the business aspect of it, the operations that will kind of give you, um, that'll make you a cut above the rest if you're really looking holistically at what it takes to run a fashion um, brand. And I think that will kind of make you a stand out, yeah. I think um, one more question um, before we kind of get into the Q&A is, I wouldn't say so much music, but definitely like advertising and marketing and kind of like film and TV, um, being older in your, um, in your journey isn't really too discriminatory. Like, I feel like a lot of the people killing it in film and TV are actually much older um, correct me if I'm wrong like that is it's almost like the more seasoned you are in what you do the the better it, it the better the opportunities and advertising and marketing I remember when I used to work at a tech company everyone seemed like they were like in their you know 40s onwards Michael correct me if I'm wrong but um fashion and music if I'm if I've just done seven years in corporate land or just doing something else that I don't want to do and I'm now 30 31 is it going to be easy or hard for me to get into music or fashion I think for fashion people it's so fast-paced that we actually love when someone can come in and hit the ground running and you know sometimes when someone hasn't had the experience of life they're a lot more kind of timid or you kind of have to train them up. So actually the advantage of being older is that you have had life experiences. You tend to be more confident. So you can use that to your advantage and kind of show people that you are able, you know, yes, you're kind of new to it, but you are confident. You can maybe, you know, um, put yourself forward for a lot more things. You can confidently hit the ground running and may even get more responsibility than actually someone that's kind of like a fresh graduate student um and so i think i think you just kind of have if you are changing your career you almost just have to let go of that and just be confident enough to be like i've had life experience i can do this i want to work for this business i want to work for this brand i want to do this internship and people will be kind of drawn to that confidence and just being able to give someone a task and know that they can kind of get on with it and use their initiative 
is I think a really great skill in fashion because it is so fast paced. People kind of don't like, you know, when I got this job at Fiorucci, it's very much, it's actually a very small setup. So I pretty much run that kind of whole department. It's very autonomous and they just want you to get on with it. They don't want you to ask questions like you figure it out yourself type thing. And so if you can demonstrate that you are someone that could use your initiative, hit the ground running. If you don't know, you know, how something works, you can figure it out. You know, you're outspoken. People will want to, that's a very employable person. Um, so yeah, I think you just kind of have to think about your those kind of transferable skills. Yeah. Um, I think for music, um, it sort of really depends on your role. I think in marketing specifically, they did want to see like you have years experience at a label or a distribution company. Because um, I actually, before coming into my role now, I did take a slight demotion because I'd had this marketing experience, which was valuable, but they needed to see that you understand how a label works because that's a whole other world. And so, um, yeah, for marketing, definitely, I think it does help to have experience in the industry. I think for, you know, maybe like a paid social role, an analyst role, because we have um, all those roles at um, my record label, I think it might be easier if you're coming from, you know, more of a corporate side. So if you're a data analyst, we have a data analyst at our company that analyzes all the streaming and performance data and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, if you are coming from corporate, maybe just have a look at the opportunities that are out there and see if, you know, there's a, there's a direct fit. Amazing. Perfect. All right, let's get into the Q&A. Um, loving the, 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 the answers so far. I think all your experiences are just so unique. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Remy Branco, would you mind answering, asking your question live to the panelists? Because I think this is quite a good one to discuss. Hello. Hiya. Hey, you're right. I'm good, thanks. This is this is this conversation has come in clutch for me, honestly, because as you know from my Q and A question or whatnot, I am a freelance filmmaker for about four years. I started before I entered into university. Funny enough, I studied law and politics in university, and I graduated. So. I graduated last year, so. Well done. Um, um, but I've always had a passion for media, production, filmmaking, videography, all of that good stuff. But I noticed that as I was working in the field, a lot of people questioned the authenticity of my work, um, especially me being a black woman in a predominantly male industry. Um, it came across as though they didn't believe that I was the one producing it. I was the one directing it. I was the one filming it. Um, I, d I don't know. I, I, they There was even one time I was film, um, filming at an event. The amount of men that came up to me and was like, oh, are you the photographer? Are you the photographer? Are you the, it was like, do you just think women are just photographers? Like they can't do anything else. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I just wanted to ask, how do you overcome this? barrier because I do feel like it's quite limiting in a way it does surprise people but it's quite limiting um and also how do you like get your foot in the door because as a freelancer I haven't necessarily brought been brought up with a company I've just been doing it by myself I am associated with quite a few production houses but again I'm still a standalone freelancer person so it'll be great to know how you could overcome this issue essentially i mean israel take it away <laughs> um i'm gonna try and remember everything but i might come back to you so i think you, in your comment you mentioned four years yeah um and i i i was very similar in that i went freelance straight out of uni and everyone thought i was crazy um because how else do you build experience so i think you've done you've done well but believe it or not one thing i learned about the our beloved creative industry it's very it's very it's not just elitist but it's also very like because everyone has had like 15 years being a runner mm -hmm. and they finally got their break they're not about to let someone who's just arrived 
like get the spot. So that's something you're gonna have to battle with for a while because it happens everywhere. Like production houses, even in-house, you know, they're like, why is she? St-? The reality is they've seen you've done good work and it's taking you little time and a few of them are threatened. So that's unfortunately, that's something you're gonna have to deal with. Mm. But don't be disheartened because it means you're obviously producing good work, if that makes sense. Because the flip side is, the flip side is they're like, oh, good effort. Do you know what I mean? The flip side is that they become patronizing and like they don't rate your work at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, secondly, I would highly recommend um, definitely going in-house at one of the production companies you, ha- you have worked with or finding somewhere. And that's not to say don't freelance, but so what I had to do, and I wouldn't necessarily advise this, but I'll tell you anyway, I had to start a production company because as an individual, they don't, you're right, they don't really put respect on individuals' names. Yeah. But as a company, it's different because they feel like, you know, there's there's one piece of advice I got recently um, and they were like, you know, as a company, you can just make up 15 different emails, but you're all 15 people. And like, <laughs> you can just create the illusion of, of sort of industry where you are. Um, so I, I would recommend definitely finding... <laughs> Um, some right. kind of production house or a company that you actually really like their work and reaching out. And one thing I've loved about the last maybe two or three years is that there's a ton of black production companies. There's a couple completely women only production companies as well. I will try find them and drop them in the link, but there's, there's places where you will feel valued because I, kn- I know how that feels where, you know, you walk into a room and it's just gray haired white men mm-hmm. everywhere. And you're just like, I don't even know how to have a conversation with you because you're exactly. just always bantering about going to Santorini. You've never <laughs> sometimes, been. So, sometimes yeah. it's even like, so, sometimes I'm not even saying this to glow or in any way, shape or form because I don't see it as a badge of honour. But sometimes it's, they, they make moves on me essentially. And then when I sure. turn down, it's, oh, we don't want you anymore. It's, it's, it's quite... I've had to go through a lot. It's it's quite annoying, um, but yeah. yeah we've, I've don't... heard that story a few times actually because yeah. there are some really dope like young women who are doing great work. But you're right that that's another barrier you guys have to deal with, which is insane. Mm-hmm. But the yeah, end, I will try find those links. I mean, you know, I know a few production houses, so I will try put those in the chat for you. Oh, great. Um, Thank where you. it is like all black and there are like women only production houses as well and it's just about you know presenting yourself and most of them would give opportunities because I think they also recognize how difficult it is um but yeah don't be disheartened there are a lot of you know difficult people in our industry um and a lot of them just have a chip on their shoulder because they they were runners for 10 years and they haven't produced anything themselves they've always produced for someone else and so they there's there's almost an admiration that you've just gone and done what you wanted to do but they would never admit that right amazing um i hope that answered your question weren't me it did thank you so okay. much no worries uh cindy are you there you had a good question well very straightforward question let me know if you're there yeah i'm here awesome do you want to ask away uh, yeah, let me read it. Well, I'll just speak it. Well, I'm a, I'm a self-taught fashion designer. Um, but my I have zero professional experience because I studied biomedical science and I've worked since I'd left uni, I've worked in that industry. So I want to work in fashion, but I just don't know what the best route can be because on my CV, I can just write what I've done, but it's almost not recognized because I don't have any professional experience. So how else can I get noticed apart from just writing what I know? Yeah, I think, um, I think, do you kind of use Instagram at all to share, you know, your sort of fashion design skills? I think that would be a really good start. um, If you're not already really kind of curating a portfolio and showing, um, you know, a a mood board, what you're kind of interested in um, sharing your actual designs on there. And then I think what's really important for you is to try and get an internship. Um, So I think earlier we put in the chat fashionjobs.com. There's like hundreds and hundreds of internships on there. 
it's a really, really good platform to find, um, you know, especially like small brands. There's so many independent brands that are always looking for, um, you know, help with their fashion design department. So I'd really, you know, encourage you to go on those platforms and literally just apply to all of them, you know, find out who put that job ad on there, find them on Instagram, DM them, people, you know, fashion, there's so many, there's just so much that makes up, you know, running this business that, and, you know, they, they need the help. They want that support from creative people. Um, and so I think, you know, you'd be surprised, even if you aren't from, you don't have a background in fashion, if you can kind of show how passionate you are about it and your understanding for it, and just that you're, you know, a very, very good at working and a hard worker, they will, you know, kind of come back to you. You just have to be consistent. So I'd say definitely, um, if you can, I'm, I'm not sure if they're always paid these days. I know back in my day, none of the internships were paid. I think it could be different now. But if you can definitely try and get, you know, as many internships, even if you don't even like the brand, I think the main thing is you just need experience at this point. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah, it does. And I'm, I'm also aware of the importance of like networking and just putting yourself in, in an environment where there are other like like-minded people in a similar industry. But I feel, I feel as though, you know, I don't know how to find networking events that are fashion related, if not just going out and happen, you know, happen to meet somebody that's in fashion. How else can I like find mm. events that are where I can, where I can interact with other people that are in fashion? If I'm honest, there isn't, I think there's more events for like stylists, um, things like that. So I know kind of like Eventbrite, Meetup, there's loads of things on there for um, stylists um, and that kind of part of fashion photographers. But in terms of design, I really think your kind of best bet is actually Insta um, Instagram, networking through social media. I think as designers, we're always on Instagram, always, you know, saving images, always posting. And I think the best way is to actually just reach out, you know, go on LinkedIn is a really good way to find people that are doing what you want to do. So I'd say, you know, go on LinkedIn, find um, fashion designers on there, then go and find their profile on Instagram and DM them and say, you know, are you looking for any um, internships at the minute? I'm new to the industry. Um, you know, this is what I'm good at. I can do this. Make sure to also look at the job spec of what, you know, it means to be a fashion designer and try and learn these skills because you're not coming from the background. It's really important to learn the skills, um, you know, understanding garment construction, go to different stores and actually just look at clothes and, and try and understand how, how are these garments made. There's loads of books you can get on Amazon as well that are all about like pattern cutting. Although you wouldn't be physically doing that, you need to understand how, you know, garments are made so try and like learn as much as you can by looking at these job specs and seeing what they require you to do then you kind of need to work backwards and from that just start messaging um, fashion designers production managers um, product developers you know and just kind of saying this is what I can do are you um, employing any internships but then also go on the job boards like fashionjobs.com where there's going to be you know posts of internships I think that's a kind of really good place to start okay thank you so much yeah because I think similar to you I, I'm just not aware of all the different roles like I already I'm even sewing right now like I know how to sew and make clothes it's just knowing how I can then you know go into that professionally or what you know I may go into an industry and find another role that's not fashion design but I may be more interested in so yeah you should look at um a garment technology is what they call um, people that actually sew the clothes and like make the patterns and garment techs are really really niche but it's something that everyone needs so I think as another thing as well that a good friend of mine did she's actually done an apprenticeship and that's a brilliant way to get in she's done an apprenticeship with um it's just a two-year course 
with I can't remember what it's called it's like a fashion institution in the West End and then a part of that apprenticeship you actually learn on the job and then now she's doing garment tech so that could be a good way for you to get in as well because that's something that you know not everyone really enjoys actually physically so that could be a good a good thing for you yeah oh, thank you so much yeah. that's amazing. amazing I hope that answered your question um just to kind of um piggy bank off what Alice said I think especially with fashion and actually with any industry um, one way to stand out is to understand to read articles about what the future of said industry is about so five six years ago they said that the future of social the future of marketing would be influencer marketing and paid and SEO so anyone who listen to that and decided to be an expert in that field now are one of many few people who are able to probably demand as much as they want because they've then perfected what was meant to be this innovative thing back in the day now has become such an essential thing um to the highest level um i know with fashion it's all about sustainability we're going through climate change. So anything that can basically make the fashion industry seem sustainable, maybe read up on those things to see how you can then be somebody that can answer or solve the problems or the issues within that industry. And, and then that could be another way that you can stand out. Music, 10 years ago, streaming was a thing, but it was like, mm. but now, go into the music industry, Spotify, Audio Mac, all of that lot is literally like the, the, like the most important thing in the, in a artist's career at the moment. So if you know your numbers, if you can read data, you're winning. That's your way into the industry. You can stand out and get into music just by understanding data, because that is really all they care about at the moment. You know what I mean? Um, so definitely go on, go read up about the future of said industry, see what people's predictions are and see if you can apply what you're learning right now to those predictions so that in the next couple of years, you're one of many few who have been able to master that. Um, we've got a really cool question. Um, I hope I'm saying your name right. Mandy Zole? Yeah, <laughs> one of oh. the very few that said it correctly. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, ask away uh, my question is so actually let me start with my career like aspect so basically I am a 2020 graduate I have a degree in fashion marketing and management and I currently have just finished while well, finishing like in two weeks time my master's in design innovation and brand management so now my issue is how do you like stand out in terms of obviously when you apply for jobs the issue now we're having as 2020 graduates is the fact that we're not up against the people we graduated with. We're now up against people who lost their jobs at ASOS, at Topshop or any other fashion industry company or any other marketing brand that have has dissolved in the time while obviously Corona was going on. And obviously that's the fight that we're having. And how do you stand out in terms of that? Because obviously now I feel like I'm overqualified because obviously now I've got a master's and it's yeah and obviously I ha my internships that I've done previously are now becoming like two years old because obviously I did it when I was still at uni and now I've been unemployed for like a whole year in the time so yeah very valid question any thoughts on that um I would say one thing to do is and this is just something that I would do um start something start anything start an idea you have in your head start to formalize idea and make it a practical thing that someone says tangible so someone can see because you're right you're up against people who have lost their jobs stuff like that so but where you can come into you're young you're you're new the ideas you have as someone that may not know everything that's going on just start it because it might be a job or something that someone's looking for that hasn't even met you yet so a lot of my friends that what I did like I have one one particular friend a lot of he wanted to get into innovation but never had understood how to do it so he just started doing innovation things for like restaurants around the corner. He started building his own case studies. So when he had his CV, when he had like his, bought his own portfolio, he had all these business ideas that he's already done. So then when he's now going into GSK, like years on, they've seen that, be like, okay, that's the reason why he got the job. 
So now it's about going outside of your qualifications because although they are like great that you've got them, starts just like it's not that cheesy line, which I like to say, but I don't like to say sometimes is that be the change you want to see. So if you want these particular roles, you're gonna have to be in a position where you be persistent enough to make up the role for yourself, even when you're not being paid. So that way, when you get into those doors, they can see you're a self starter. That would be one key way to stand out. Because a lot of like recruits I've spoken to, or especially in my industry or people who are high up, the one thing they look for in their candidates now, because it is a quite like saturated market, is like what have you done on your own that's actually going to make a difference to your role and to the business that we want to bring you into. So that would be my advice. So that I would do that. Just start some of the ideas you may have in your head. And you never know, it might just be the thing that you start doing by yourself and that can be your next career. But just start, start building, what do you want to see in marketing? How can you apply it to anyone that's around you and use them as your like stepping stones to where you eventually want to go to or what agencies you want to get involved with? Um, <clears throat> I would actually also just say, um, try and increase your visibility using things like, um, what's it called, LinkedIn. So from like a marketing perspective, like if you know you want to sort of stand out, maybe get into the conversation, read up, um, sort of articles like said he said on marketing week or I don't know like just different sort of um, articles um, about you know the future of the industry get in the conversation share articles you might even want to like post um, a thought a, a think piece yourself and from there your network if anybody likes it you will also come up on their page as well so that's another way to just sort of increase your visibility in your bio put I'm looking for this sort of role you can toggle your um special settings to say that you're looking for specific positions. Um, that's how I would um, approach it if I was you. Okay, thank you, that's fine. Thank you very oh, much. No worries. So we have come to the end of the event, guys. We've got about four minutes to spare. Before you guys go, um, I would love if maybe Dami or Stella could just tell everyone about the feedback form. If you just pop up. Pop your video on. Are you there? No. Ah, oh, there you are. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, this event was amazing. So we really, really, really love your feedback. Um, the link has been put in the chat. It's going to be posted in the chat again. Please give us feedback. Let us know um what you thought. Also, if you have any questions as well that haven't been answered, if you put in the feedback, we'll try and get that answered for you as well. Um, there's a section at the end that says any other questions, so you can just put it in there and then we can try and um, respond to that because we are aware we can get through all the questions. But um, yeah, it's been, yeah, it's been an amazing event. Um, Mercedes, have you got anything else that you want to add before I do a closing? Um, yeah. I yeah, so I just hope that, you know, we were able to answer as many questions as possible, that you were able to get a real insight into how you can break into the creative industry. I think what I love about the panellists today is that all their journeys were so unique, but there was definitely lots of themes and consistencies that they all displayed as well. Um, so please, please, please go out there and apply, shoot your shot like literally you are your biggest plug so you have to go out there um if you want it that badly um please fill out the feedback form because if you fill out the feedback form we'll be able to um send across um our panelists like linkedins and all the details that you can do to kind of get in touch with them um if you have any further questions um panelists you guys don't mind us sharing like your linkedin and stuff like that so that they can connect with you guys further so yeah fill out that feedback form so then we can um send it to you guys that do that um will this recording be able to be shared yeah so we'll put we'll put um the recording on our youtube page um and worship tabernacle so um look out for it. it should be up by the end of the week hopefully um and yeah you can go back take notes because i know there's a lot of gems so yeah you'll be able to re-watch this absolutely um a last a last phrase thought quote inspo tag that um you guys would like to share Sean? um i actually don't know what to say maybe just um just keep trying um yeah don't be disheartened and also keep god involved um yeah alice 
Yeah, I think I'm pretty similar. Um, in all things, just put it in prayer and, you know, just kind of confess favour over all your job application. I would always lay hands on my CV and speak favour over it. So, yeah, I'd say definitely um, bring God into everything you do. Israel, um, there's a lot of pressure because you are a pastor's child. So anything you want to say? Um, Any don't be afraid to make Bible mistakes. scriptures you want to share? <laughs> Uh, don't be afraid to make mistakes uh what and book and chapter was that in the bible do you know what my favorite book and my favorite book for just someone who was absolutely proactive is nehemiah hey cheeks um but yeah um yeah don't <laughs> be afraid that. to make mistakes yeah nice michael make as many as possible oh sorry no i'm done thank you <laughs> michael um be persistent be very, very persistent, never give up. Um, all of us on this panel had mad journeys to get to where we are to today. You're still young, you're still trying to get there. You've got years to go, just keep being persistent. Sweet, that's it, it's a wrap. Thank you guys, enjoy the rest of your evening. Go watch Love Island. Can we say that, can we say that? <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone, um, yeah. Just thank you. Uh, make sure you follow Worship Tabernacle so you can get updates. Um, we do, we have been doing events um, every month. We're going to take a break next month, but um, we will make an announcement about our next event. But thank you, everyone. And obviously, we just want to thank God. Um, we thank God for our panelists. They were all amazing, amazing journeys. And we just pray that, you know, God will just have favor over everyone that has attended today. Um, but yeah, take care and bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.